British Army Doctrine in Normandy, 1944. Work in Progress. A 48-minute presentation held in the Dunkirk Lecture Theatre at the Joint Services Command Staff College, Shrivenham, on the 24th of October, 2007. The speaker is Professor John Buckley from the University of Wolverhampton. Professor Buckley. I should say that this is work in progress, so both for them and for me. So these are where I am at the moment for an ongoing project uh, for a book about the British Army in Northwest Europe, 1944-45. So it ties in with the kind of work I've been doing before on armour and kind of infantry armour cooperation in the Normandy campaign. But also the, the, the pushing it on into what happens later and after Normandy. But one of the things that emerged out of this was the kind of, well, a number of things, but um, two of which I want to briefly talk about and one of which I want to focus on a little bit more. And that is the kind of, firstly, the image of the British Army in the Normandy campaign. So I'm going to talk a little bit why we see, why we have this perception of the British Army being the way that it is usually recorded as being uh, during the Normandy campaign at kind of an operational and doctrine level. And I want to talk a little bit about operational doctrine, operational level doctrine, but that's already been done to a certain degree. And then some tentative suggestions about how we might look at battle doctrine, so actually how you translate operational ideas onto the battlefield. So as I say, this is work in progress and some of the things, of course, you may violently disagree, which is good. But starting with how we see the British Army in the Northwest European theatre, but particularly in Normandy, is quite important because it informs the way in which we now look back and try and revisit some of these debates and so on. And although the kind of a strategic success story here, that within the space of three months they get to the borders of Germany, achieve many of their objectives in conjunction with the Americans and Canadians, obviously. There is a debate on why they get stuck for such a period of time in Normandy itself, but by the 12th of September, as this old map tells us, they're approximately where they expected to be the following year. So they're well ahead of schedule, they've achieved the kind of the broader strategic aims, and it's part of a package of things. And in, in doing this, the 7th and 5th Army, uh, German armies, wiped out, effectively destroyed during this campaign. A considerable success story on a strategic level. And the official view, the wonderful Maidrosi's book, or two volume series, the, the battle, first one on the Battle of Normandy, typical, well, I say the typically of uh, official histories. Some official histories are certainly better than others. This one has its limitations in as much as what it doesn't tell you is what it does tell you. The kind of anodyne view, the conduct of 21st Army Group operations during the battle, normally gives little occasion for adverse criticism. Its troops have been consistently well led, and it sort of pushes on into broader areas. So the official view at the time, and for a period afterwards, was that there isn't really a problem. Strategically, everything goes roughly according to plan. You can hear Montgomery talking here. It all goes according to plan. There's no big issue here. But that's not how it's been seen in writings away from the official view, and certainly from Montgomery's memoirs. If we look at the wonderful Max Hastings, um, he's written two volumes which cover this kind of period. Max Hastings always gives the view that he writes military history for a, a certain group of people, um, telling a tale uh, that he thinks, are, he believes in, I, I'm sure, but also that he thinks they're also going to buy into. And it's sharply critical in a number of ways of British military conduct, allied military conduct more broadly, uh, during the 44-45 campaign. The kind of criticism uh, Hastings talks about, usually he focuses on equipment. Equipment is a big thing. If the Allies had had German tanks, the Normandy campaign would have been over much faster, which is debatable, disagree, but that's his uh, particular views put forward. And more broadly on uh, doctrine, operational approaches, Hastings' view has been that the British don't engage with the requirements of modern warfare in 1944-45, and this is one of the factors which precipitates the slow progress through the Normandy campaign and also generates problems later on. They have all these huge uh, resources, they're not able to finish the job quickly and he puts it down to a number of things. Poor doctrine, inadequate grasp of operational techniques, lack of fighting drive on the part of junior commanders and soldiers and equipment issues. This is a, a kind of negative picture that Hastings, in two very popular books, Overlord and more recently in Armageddon, and he peddles the same kind of stuff in Armageddon that he was writing 20-odd years beforehand in Overlord. Still, probably the best single volume on the Normandy campaign is Carl Death's decision in Normandy, but again, this conforms to a degree to the view that the British 
suffered what he, a desk calls it the, the price of caution, is by not being more aggressive and not driving on the battlefield, they generate problems later and don't get the job done as effectively as they otherwise might have done. And John Ellis's brute force, which rather gives a game about where he's coming from, Allied strategy and tactics in the Second World War, again follows the same kind of line that it's resources, sheer weight of numbers, and this overcomes inadequacies in the way in which the British intend to fight or actually end up fighting the campaign. Because they don't necessarily intend to end up fighting it according to Ellis in the way they do, it just emerges from what's gone on. Williamson Murray and Al Millay, 2004. One thing you don't want to engage uh, in is a bar talk with Williamson Murray about the British Army's performance in Northwest Europe in 1944-45. It's usually a one-way uh, conversation in which he tells you what they did wrong, which is entertaining enough, but at one o'clock in the morning, and after too much to drink, he's probably too heavy going. But it mirrors the kind of work that he's done before on military effectiveness, and in this more popular work of fighting in the Second World War, Murray uses uh, comments along the lines of the single greatest failure of the British Army in World War II is an inability to impose, to develop and impose a single battle doctrine or approach to war on its fighting forces. And so that's fairly clearly stating where, where he thinks the, the weaknesses fell. And Russell Hart's book, Clash of Arms, which covers all the main combatant armies within the Normandy campaign, he establishes and sets up this idea of a kind of a pecking order, a league table of effectiveness. Obviously, the Germans are at the top, the Americans come in second, the British third, the Canadians somewhere down at the bottom. This is the kind of order of effectiveness in terms of Hart's uh, analysis. This is the kind of, I, I suppose, the orthodox view. This, I think, encapsulates it best. Latino's book, Blitzkrieg, he's written widely on operational warfare, concepts of Blitzkrieg and so on. Here he's talking about none of the operations in Normandy, certainly up to and including Goodwood, was carried out in the spirit of mobile warfare. What the British Army lacked were officers who could recognise such momentary opportunities when they arose, and a military culture that encouraged them to seize those golden moments. I think we can encapsulate all of this into a couple of key criticisms. The first, the British failed to understand and adopt modern manoeuvre warfare, as it was talked about at the time, and therefore, I've said resorted here, but thinking about it, were only able to employ attritional, ponderous techniques in order to deal with the Germans. It worked, but after a fashion, and this is where the criticism lies. Secondly, in terms of the doctrines of how, at lower unit level, the British failed to learn from the experience of battle prior to the Normandy campaign, and indeed during the Normandy campaign, and therefore failed to generate appropriate doctrine and to impose it rigorously on their armies. And a number of studies have indicated there is some justification in this. Consequently, the British Army embarked on the North West European campaign with questionable levels of doctrine in terms of how it's embedded, whether it's the right approach, and how effective it's going to be. The roots of this orthodoxy, I think, come from four sources, and which influence the kind of writings of Hastings and others, and push debate in a particular direction. I've broken down to four. The first is what I call the, the post-war cartel, a group of interested parties who wanted to influence, to push a particular view of how the British Army had functioned. Little Hart, of course, spent most of the, the 50s and 60s rewriting military history along the lines of, if only they'd listened to me. And he does this particularly with how the British operationally uh, function in Northwest Europe. They hadn't learned the lessons in the way that the Germans had. The Germans had learned the lessons because they read Little Heart properly. Now, we know that that's largely a, a fabrication, but that's how he sold a particular view, dating back to the late 40s, because in his correspondence with various people. Chester Wilmot was with the Allied forces during the uh, Northwest European campaign and wrote, in particular, the book the Struggle for Europe. The view that the British Army had struggled, along with others, Allied forces generally, the British Canadians in particular, because they lacked the drive. They weren't driven in the way that was necessary in order to engage in close combat. Whereas the Germans were, the Allies weren't. And this, he indicated, was a singular weakness of the Allied approach. And that's why they kept it in the problem they did. Smaller bodies of German forces were able to hold up much larger Allied forces. Gifford Lacane Martel, wonderful name, written before the Second World War about how important armoured warfare would be in the future. And post-war, immediate post-war period, used the Normandy campaign and examples from Northwest Europe to demonstrate how German techniques 
would be much more effective in stopping the Russians than Allied techniques had been during the Second World War. So trying to demonstrate what could be learned from World War II and use these terms that linear defence is no good and you need flexible mobile defence if necessary, rather misses the point that in Normandy the Germans employed linear defence, for the most part anyway, on an operational level. But it also takes on to the, the Cold War, which was raising a, a number of questions about how we viewed military operational doctrine and so on. And it was largely focused around how you stop the Russians. And this growing important area in the 50s influences ultimately the way in which historians and uh, armed forces tended to look back on the Normandy campaign. It's kind of a retrospective rewriting. Maneuver warfare, or loosely anyway, uh, was the key. That's what the lesson had been learned from World War II. That if you wanted to be effective, rather than engaging in drawn-out, heavy-handed attrition, appropriate ways, look at what the Germans did, in short, anyway. So it leads to a retrospective selective reading of World War II, to the extent that examples are drawn from Normandy to reinforce a view that the British Army in particular had taken. A model example of how to stop the Russians in the post-war period would be to look at what the Germans had done to stop the Goodwood Offensive in July 1944. That's the model, and they actually try to get Sandhurst historians to use this in a battlefield tour to demonstrate how effective this, this particular approach would be, until the military historians at Sandhurst rebelled and said that's not actually true, but you see the pressure that has grown during this particular period. The Germans have also played a, a key role in shaping our view of the Northwest European campaign, particularly the German generals who are excellent at portioning blame for everybody other than themselves as to why they lost the Northwest European campaign, particularly the Normandy campaign. Partly, they were simply outnumbered, so there was nothing they could do. The Luftwaffe let them down. And that really, if you take those two things out of the equation, you get a, Max Hastings used this term, an even or a fair fight between two units of German or British or whoever the Germans would win. Well, that doesn't necessarily hang together, but that's the kind of view that post-war German military professionals from the Second World War tried to put across. That's what they told Little Hart in particular. They were critical of Allied fighting power. You had all these resources, yet you still couldn't beat us in an acceptable amount of time. We would have beaten you much faster, if only it hadn't been the fact you had more and we don't have air support. The Germans are also excellent at propaganda in terms of low-level military prowess on the battlefield. They did it much better. At the time, a lot of Western views on how the Russian army fights, or fights in the Second World War, is, goes through the prism of German perceptions. And likewise, how the British see themselves, and the Americans and the Canadians, is through the prism of how the Germans see them. And this kind of approach shapes the way in which we view the campaign. And, of course, on top of all that, at a more general level, there's this popular fascination with a popular readership and writing with the SS, German military efficiency, and generally technology. The Germans had the best tanks, they had the best uniforms, they had the best kit. Therefore, they must have been good, and they were only beaten by sheer weight of numbers. I think two particular examples of this, which are interesting, but amuse me in a particular kind of way, is Dupuy's book, A Genius for War. We think about that. It all strikes me that it's kind of the genius of Sven Joran Eriksson, which is very good in the preparation and getting you to the point at which you can take part in the main event, but not actually good in making the final results stick. A genius for war. The two biggest war Germany fights during the period boys talk about, they're horribly beaten. You might argue you could go for a different title, a genius for certain levels of operational manoeuvre, operations and so on. Maybe. When it comes to actually fighting a war, that's somewhat different. But by 82, Van Crevel's book, uh, Fighting Power German and U.S. Army Performance 3945, the first page of something along the lines of, it's well known that the German army was much better than the American army in the Second World War. I'm going to find out why. And then proceeds to go into a great deal of discussion about why the German army was good at certain things. So taking as its starting point the previous view, perhaps influenced by this perception of the Germans, that the Germans were, were good at war. I'm not going to go into American bashing here at this point, but there is an influence on the way in which the British Army's performance has been seen from the Americans. The Americans were keen on learning from the Germans from World War II, and naturally there was an anti-Montgomery sentiment, the Battle of the Memoirs, as I called it, and not without justification. I'm not saying that the Americans were wrong here. Montgomery did a great deal to shape our impression of how the British and the Allies fight in the Northwest European campaign. 
mainly by annoying so many people that when they came to write their memoirs and came to influence our perceptions, they took a, a much more contrary position to what Montgomery had been saying in order to reinforce their own positions. So when Eisenhower Bradley came to write their memoirs, Montgomery had already got in with his and said that everything had gone wrong and been blaming it on the Americans if only they listened to me. Unsurprisingly, the Americans viewed things differently. For good political reasons, the Americans were in a senior position in the Northwest European campaign. Montgomery never really grasped that. I won't say he didn't understand that that was a situation, but he didn't grasp the implications of that. And, of course, Montgomery's inability to get on with Patton and Patton's inability to get on with anybody like Montgomery also influenced the way in which the campaign was seen. That's not to say that there are rights and wrongs. And Stephen Hart, in his book on operational art in 21st time, he's right to say that we shouldn't let our perceptions of Montgomery's peculiar personality obscure the fact of how effective or ineffective, operational art was within 21st Army Group. But it does shape our understanding of how others have seen the campaign and why it is seen in this particular way. We've seen this in examples of popular imagery as well, a bridge too far, who are seen to be the, the army that stops for tea, doesn't think on its feet, uh, is inflexible, uh, doesn't listen to intelligence. It's the British Army. Now, there may be elements of truth in all of that, but the way in which it's put across in a film demonstrates that there's a kind of view which has started to emerge. It's even in Saving Private Ryan, Ted Danson, of all people, as tells us a, a great deal about military conduct in World War II, makes a, a throwaway comment that Montgomery's overrated. I mean, the idea that a soldier in the midst of fighting in Normandy would be passing such comments of that nature is ludicrous beyond belief, but it's still it's in there, and it tells us something, I think. So the image of... Second British Army during the Northwest European campaign in Normandy, something along these lines. It's ponderous, it's too reliant on material and kit, it's sticky is one of the terms of use, it's predictable. The Germans all say the, the Allies do the same thing time and time again, which clearly isn't true, but that's the, the story put across. The soldiers are timid, that they lack fighting zeal and, and spirit. The leadership is unimaginative, the army is cautious and is weak in doctrine. This is the kind of view that has been established over this period. I think we need, however, to take a step back and think about the terms and the parameters of the debate as to what we're actually looking for in here. Because most of the critics have measured the British efforts against concepts of what the Germans had been doing and what perhaps the British Army was hoping, or what particularly American Army and post-45 armies were hoping to move towards which was not reliant on brute force or attrition and so on. Many critics retrospectively wanted the British and the Allies to have fought in a particular kind of way, even like the Soviets, to a degree, willing to take the pain in order to get the campaign over with quickly. Terms like Blitzkrieg or Bandit Down, perhaps more accurately, the Krieg, unreliably informed. And that's the kind of approach, it's kind of a post-war pattern which is then placed on our perceptions of how the, the Allies, and the British in particular, performed during this period of 44-45. There are two obvious problems with this analysis. The first is that the British never actually intended to fight like that in Normandy for clear political and strategic reasons, which we'll talk very briefly about. And I would also say that this interpretation is based on the kind of close combat military effectiveness idea. It's a very narrow interpretation of military effectiveness. It's not just about how units at the front line fight in close combat. Artillery, air power, and the package of supply, logistics, intelligence, all of that is a crucial part of how a campaign is fought. Yet most of the criticism and the emphasis is placed on one part of how 21st Army Group and 2nd British Army fights. I think that's arguably that's questionable, that interpretation, but in any case, it just focuses on one little part. The British are generally better, like the Americans and Canadians, are better at this kind of stuff, the broader picture, than the Germans for a variety of reasons. British Army's objective for 44-45 campaign, well, broadly it's this, I think, to put it down into five. But one, obviously, is to win. Two, to do it with tolerable casualties. They can't afford to lose too many troops in winning. They want victory by mid-45 because they'll run out of steam if it goes on much longer. Importantly, and these are pressures playing on a high level, uh, they need to remain viable for the post-war world. There's no point in winning the 44-45 campaign or beating Germany if the British Army is destroyed in doing it. But nevertheless, 4 and 5 actually work against each other 
they need to play an important enough role to demonstrate that they can sit at the, the victory table alongside Stalin and, and Roosevelt or ultimately Truman. Because they've got to demonstrate they've played a key role in beating the Germans, but they can't burn their army out in doing it. And there are lots of reasons why the British army is weak at this time. Consequently, the British army operational methods reflect these kind of uh, particular pressures. There's great emphasis placed on planning and preparation, heavy concentrations of fire support, air and artillery in order to get themselves onto objectives. Operations are fought over a narrow front to maximise the effectiveness of firepower. Infantry and armour are supposed to work closely together in order to get onto their objectives. That's where some of the problems start to emerge. Seize the objective, consolidate the position, and the important point, sometimes overlooked so to a significant degree, is the defeat of the enemy counterattack. And prior to the Normandy campaign, senior commanders, 21st Army Group staff like Guy Simmons and Dempsey and so on, already fully aware of the way in which they were going to defeat the Germans was to get them to attack them. That's easily the best way. Attacking dug-in uh, formations, even with artillery and air power, would be enormously difficult, and inflicting casualties on the Germans would likewise be a trick. The way to get them out, uh, to inflict casualties on the enemy, was to provoke them into counterattack. And the perception was that if you annoy the Germans enough, they will counterattack. Drive them off the position, German military doctrine, get it back straight away. Which, arguably, in other circumstances, would be the right approach, but it also then exposed the Germans to heavy concentrations of fire support, air and artillery. Get the enemy army to move, then you can destroy it. Whilst it's dug in, with the technology and capabilities of the day, you can't, or it's much more difficult. Finally, you would then move to a stage of exploitation, which again, because of the approach, the British and the Americans and Canadians struggled with. There are weaknesses in here, this operational approach, and things which they're not very good at. But it conforms, thinking about to the, the previous pressures, of how the British Army needs to fight in this campaign. The operational method as it develops during the campaign, and this is an important point, I think, they have a, an idea at the start, but it's developmental. They change and adapt as the campaign goes on. They have a series of set-piece battles and operations from which they derive certain lessons, which are then reinterpreted and placed into the way in which you fight the next operation. The idea that it's static and that the Allies continue to do the same thing in the same old way is clearly not the case. That's not to say they solve all the problems and become fantastically good at conducting operations. They don't. And they struggle with a lot of the issues which are self-imposed by the operational method they've chosen. But it is an ongoing learning process. And it reflects, I think, British strengths, resources, intelligence, planning, mobility, not manoeuvre, but mobility and firepower, and British weaknesses. And as an important point, most of the British army in Normandy is inexperienced. It's not an experienced army. So there's an army having to learn, develop its doctrine and its method within experienced forces in a fairly intensive theatre of operations. They've got a dwindling personnel pool, and there's perception that British soldiers cannot be imbued with the ideological fervour that the German soldiers have. Well, it's not necessarily ideological fervour, but German soldiers have been fighting for four or five years in some cases. On the Eastern Front, they have a very different view of what war is about than British, American and Canadian soldiers. Arguably, I'd say that's rather a good thing, but it's sometimes used as an example of how Allied soldiers did not have the kind of morale underpinning their efforts that the, the Germans did. Well, there's, there'd be a price to pay for getting your soldiers to that level um, of fighting spirit, if you want to use that term, uh, and that would be a, you'd have a very different army to the British uh, army as it was in 1944-45. So that's briefly on operational on methods, but one of the key criticisms is battle doctrine. I mean, of the term, the term as it was in 44, 45, which is how you translate operational ideas into how you make things happen on the battlefield, in terms of linking your R and infantry and artillery and so on, effectively. And I'd say that the general criticism, David French has made these comments as well, and so the, the, we can see there is a pattern that within British Army battle doctrines, not at operational level, which is also changing, innovating as it goes along, there is a, a view I think you can break down into a failure to learn, a failure to impose, and a failure to adapt in terms of the way in which the British approach operations on the battlefield at lower unit level. A failure to learn from previous experience prior to the Normandy campaign, from what's happened in North Africa and the Mediterranean from 1940, and from experiences of training in Britain prior to D-Day, 
A failure to impose this upon whatever your doctrine is, a failure to impose that upon the, the British Army prior to the campaign, and a failure to adapt the doctrine once you're actually fighting. And these areas, are, I, th- I think, are worthy of looking at. What about this concept of the failure to learn? Which is usually put out that the British Army doesn't learn, it keeps doing the same old things in the same old way, and gets itself into a, a pickle in 1944. Well, arguably, I'd say it's not necessarily it's a failure to learn. It may be a failure to learn in the right way, but I would argue they're actually too receptive to ideas that are floating around. They haven't settled on the way in which they're going to fight for a variety of reasons which are quite understandable. And a whole variety of options of how you do things on the battlefield emerge in the period prior to Normandy, which influence the way in which the army then goes on to fight in Normandy. There are too many ideas. There's not enough actual operational experience to shape the way in which the army is going to fight in northwest Europe. Their learning experience is fairly narrow and it arguably is skewed lessons. The lessons aren't necessarily wrong but they're not necessarily appropriate to the campaign that the British Army ends up fighting in 1944. Most of the learning is from the Mediterranean and it's difficult to argue with a winning formula, particularly when the British Army doesn't have any other formula to, to work with in terms of victory. And so the Eighth Army approach when Montgomery and his staff come back from the Mediterranean and he starts to say, this is how we're going to do things, it's difficult for the staff in 21st Army Group, who for the most part Montgomery bundles out and gets rid of, it's difficult for those remaining to say, well, well hang on, what, what you've been doing in the Mediterranean might have been right there, but it's not necessarily like the Northwest Europe. They've got six months to pull this together, and so these different ideas start to create issues about which doctrine you actually settle on. So there's no clear view of what they're going to do, particularly in terms of the classic case of infantry armour cooperation. How do you get tanks and infantry to advance onto an objective without suffering appalling casualties? And there are different views on how you do this. They might have worked in the Mediterranean, certain ideas. They're not necessarily the best for Northwest Europe, but actually demonstrating that is, is, actually, is, is difficult in the time available and incorporating these kind of ideas that are floating around. So I'd argue there isn't a failure to learn. There might be a failure to learn properly, but the ideas are there, they know about the various options available to them, but they're unable in the time and in the circumstances to alight on the right kind of doctrine. What about then the failure to impose, even if doctrines are available and how you integrate your forces on the battlefield, how do they go about in imposing them? Well, unfortunately they, they don't. If there is a failure, it is in the failure to impose a battle doctrine. There isn't a method of imposing firmly onto a British army in the 1940s, a single approach. This is how you do things. There is a culture of guidance. Doctrine is there to guide officers. And officers in the British, I think think that's not necessarily peculiar to the British, an unwillingness to learn from paper. A number of interviews with veterans, and you talk about, well, this is the pamphlet. This This is what was circulated at the time. What did you think of it? And almost all of them say, oh, I never read that. I listened to... Fred, who'd fought in the Mediterranean, and he said this was the best way to do things. The ability of the British to impose a doctrine through paper means very difficult. The British cultural approach in terms of doctrine, uh, the army level was to learn by doing, to do it in theatre, broad concepts and ideas, which they have prior to Normandy, but we'll almost we'll see when we get there. There are a number of ways in which you can do things, but there is no willingness. Uh, to impose a single idea on how you do things. Ultimately, this means that the Eighth Army can't be enforced, Eighth Army approach. So when Montgomery comes back and starts, Tim Harrison Place has written about this, and uh, quite critical of Montgomery, he brings back all these Mediterranean ideas and then tries to, as he said, throw his weight around and impose them on the 21st Army group. It doesn't work. He has limited success because the forces are unresponsive to this kind of late official approach to doctrine. Even if the Eighth Army method had been right, they probably couldn't have imposed it anyway. What you get as a result of this is doctrinal indiscipline. Different units do different things in different ways, even if they're the same kind of formation. The British fight the Normandy campaign with three orthodox armoured divisions, and they all do things differently. Even though they're supposed to be doing the same kind of thing, they all do things differently. The Seventh Armoured come back with a package of ideas of what they'd learned in the Mediterranean and try to use them in the Normandy campaign. 11th Armoured is a mix of experienced and inexperienced forces with an experienced commander. So he comes back and tries to impose on his formation some of the Mediterranean ideas, which has 
mix success and patchy success in embedding itself into 11th Armoured Division. And Guards, Armoured Division, they fight in a way which they've learnt from training in Britain, which revolves around mass squadron level shoots, that are almost like self-propelled artillery, followed by a good old charge at the enemy to overwhelm with tanks. Now, none of those particular approaches actually work particularly well in Normandy. All of them have to be adapted to the circumstances which they find themselves in. So this kind of doctrinal discipline is certainly an issue. What about the failure to adapt once they're there? Well, I would argue that this is where the British prove much more successful. They adapt with success, both at an operational level and tactically. They learn from what happens in theatre, and as doctrine is tried, it's modified, abandoned, refined, changed in order to suit the circumstances. And they're able to change their unit formation structures, the way in which they integrate to different methods. They try different things in using infantry and armour to solve a particular kind of objective at certain times, sometimes leading with infantry, sometimes leading with tanks. And they eventually light on the right kind of mix. But it takes a number of weeks to do this, which is obviously the downside to it, but it means they're able to adapt once they're there, partly because of the way in which the, the culture of doctrine within the British Army. It's a flexible approach. And it's also worth bearing in mind that the 21st Army Group is to a degree caught out by the German response in Normandy. They don't expect the Germans to fight in the way that they do, sticking close to the beach, digging in, and entering German forces piecemeal merely to hold the line. It doesn't make any sense to the, to the British and the Americans. And in a way, they're right, because it consigns the German army to a, a slow, grinding death. They expected the Germans to fall back and conduct a fighting retreat onto the terrain of their choosing in which they could use their advantage in mobile warfare. So the British army really would have, was preparing for a different kind of campaign to the one eventually it ends up fighting. So arguably, even if they had imposed a particular approach, it might well have been the wrong one. The consequences of all this, battle doctrine on 6th of June 1944 is patchy. Some units end up doing things the right way fairly quickly, others it takes longer for them to grasp the principles. And it's difficult to develop a doctrine across the entire army and get them all doing the same kind of thing, even in theatre. They've got to work up to a point at which they have an idea of what's going on. There has been a definite <coughs> failure to enforce War Office or 8th Army Doctrine in 21st Army Group at Battle Doctrine level. Operational level, they're better, as I mentioned. I would argue that this failure to enforce a doctrine actually probably saves the British Army a good deal of pain in Normandy. It would have been ideal for them to have the right doctrine properly emplaced in the army prior to the Normandy <coughs> campaign but they probably wouldn't have enforced the right doctrine for the kind of campaign they were fighting because the most likely doctrine to be imposed, if one could have been imposed, was the Eighth Armies, which in part was the wrong one. So in a way, the inability to enforce a particular approach and the way in which you use artillery to support armour and the way in which you integrate infantry and armour on the battlefield, it's as well that Montgomery's ideas weren't enforced. Let's not say that Montgomery was entirely wrong. It worked in North Africa and it worked in the Mediterranean but it needed refinement for Northwest Europe. There simply wasn't the time or the facility to do that. And it was difficult for 21st Army Group staff, as I mentioned before, to counter what was being brought back from North Africa. It was a winning formula. How can you counter that when you haven't got much to go on in terms of saying, you know, do we need to question this more forcefully? So in a way, the cultural approach, or the culture of the British Army in its approach to doctrine, gets them out of a mess because they're able to innovate once they're there. So what you get is an ability, demonstrate an ability to adapt and innovate in theatre. Not an ideal solution at all. I'm not saying this is the best way to do things. Clearly it's not. But in the circumstances of an inexperienced army, too many ideas floating around, and an inability to impose the right doctrine, a flexible approach actually gets them out of the mess they're in. Many of the issues are solved in theatre. Arguably, controversially, it's more flexible than German doctrine. When you talk about the Germans being masters of the battlefield and so on, you always hesitate to say, well, actually, they don't do everything particularly spectacularly well in Northwest Europe. We've no idea whether operationally they're better than the Allies because the Allies never let them conduct a major operation. They're always reactive to what the Allies are doing. But in terms of battle doctrine, the Germans struggle to throw off the idea that proper response to an Allied offensive is an immediate counterattack. Sometimes it might be, but a lot of the time it's not. And what you end up doing is throwing troops into situations where they get destroyed by Allied artillery and Allied air power. You, you draw them into, into a counterattack. And one of the perceptions that we put forward is that this was a byproduct of the way in which the British approach operations in Normandy. It isn't. 
senior commanders clearly stated beforehand they had a grasp on how they were going to deal with the Germans, and this was it. They knew that the Germans would do this, and they employed an operational method in order to, to draw on this particular weakness, and it took the Germans a long time to get out of this. Conclusions. Yes, I will shut up eventually. I would say that the image of the British Army's performance in Northwest Europe is to a degree misleading for a variety of reasons. Thinking about the kind of historical and historiographical reasons about why we see the British Army in the way that we do. But it's misleading to a degree. I'm not saying that's completely wrong. There are elements of, as ever with these kind of things, and elements of, of reality in them. I'd say that strategically and operational, it was sound enough. It worked to a significant degree and got them through the situation they were in. There were clearly expected and unexpected weaknesses in the approach they adopted and had adopted since 1942-43. And that was you were never going to get, or unlikely to get, dynamic uh, breakthroughs a la 1940, kind of blitzkrieg style, and in 1941 that you know, a lot of pop writers tend to, uh, to put across. You were much less likely to get that, but what you were likely to get was a, something which met the strategic and political needs which had been stated at the start of the campaign. Finally, I would say that British doctrine was initially confused, there's no doubt about that, but they managed to engage, because of this culture of adaptability, they get workable solutions, which are not always the best solutions that could be employed, but they were the best that were available to the British in the circumstances they were in at the time, and solved most of the problems that they engaged with. Ultimately, I would say, British Army, a job well done. Eight out of ten. You know, there are kind of weaknesses within their approach, but it gets them through. And the context of where the British Army was in 1944 always needs to be borne in mind in understanding whether or not this was a job well done or not. Professor Buckley was asked the following six questions. Question one. Would you concur that it doesn't matter what doctrine the British Army adopted... The fact that the army adapts is key. To a degree, yes. As the British Army was in 19, the 1940s, armies prepare for the next war by learning to fight the, the last war or something like that. I think in this case it's probably true. But it, it, it's difficult to judge how good the British Army was at formulating doctrine because the experience they have and where they have success is it's just a narrow area and uh, it's a completely different set of circumstances to as they were going to fight in, in northwest Europe that we, we don't know whether the British Army would have been able to get to the point at which it would have a, uh, an appropriate doctrine for northwest Europe. The doctrine as it was or the way in which they fight it in North Africa works well enough and in view of the circumstances of what happened prior to mid-1942 the problems they have suddenly they start to win the old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I think that was largely Montgomery's approach. And self-reflection is difficult in those circumstances. You always hear sportsmen saying, oh, I, I don't think about it, I just do what I know works. And I, to a degree, I think that's how the British Army functions. It helps the British Army's culture, you say, of not having a preset doctrine, but thinking more flexibly. Because of its historical, developed historical, I think, of why it gets to the position it's in and gets it out of the mess that it ends up in a little bit in 1944. So to degree, yes, yeah, so I think that's, that's true. Question two. You talked about the operational methods of using heavy concentrations of firepower. Do you think it was a good idea to tie up resources in that way? Absolutely, yes. Um, you, you have a tendency to, to talk about fire support, and but naval gunfire support is obviously a crucial part of that, and it's an unexpected and pleasant bonus. And it partly falls into this idea that the... They didn't expect the Germans to stay there for precisely those kind of reasons. It, it, in many ways, it didn't make sense. It, it did in some ways for the Germans, because what options did they have? Conduct a fighting retreat and you let the Allies swarm all over you because they're much more mobile than you are. But it consigned the German army to fighting a particular kind of way and the Allies refined the way in which they integrated artillery, air power. None of these things were panaceas at all to the way in which the army fights. There's a, a perception that it's firepower alone that wins and that it's artillery, air power, and whatever fire support that's available that saves the day. That's probably not true. Because of the nature of the, the static nature of the campaign, it's actually very difficult to use firepower support to destroy the enemy. If they're moving, you can, but in the circumstances of the norm, it's very difficult. But it's, it's excellent at suppressing a target and getting you forward. With the unexpected bonus that the, the Germans stay close enough to the coast, you know, this stuff is incorporated clearly. Question three. What do you think was the most important tactical operation that took place on the battlefields of Normandy 
in terms of the process of adaptation. The way in which they integrated infantry and armour collectively on the battlefield, because at the start of the campaign, I wouldn't say they're clueless, they're desperately unfair, but they have no clear idea on how to do this. And there are so many different methods of assaulting an object with fire support. How you get your infantry and armour to work together. Do you lead with tanks? Do you lead with infantry? Do you have the infantry with the tanks? Do you have them behind? Do you have them mobile? And they try so many different approaches to this, all born out of previous experience and learning from elsewhere, either in the UK or North Africa. They get to the point where it's clear that in certain types of terrain, you need much closer integration. The infantry are got to work much, much more effectively together. And getting your infantry onto objective quickly is seen as the key in order to do that. They develop in two ways. Firstly, very quickly, formations start accepting that they've got to have the infantry on the tanks, tank riders. Now, this had been rejected prior to normally being far too dangerous for obvious reasons, that people fall off, artillery fire and everything will cause all sorts of problems, and tanks get very hot as well. But it's the only thing they can do. So they actually revert to that and come back to that idea, and it's the armoured armored formation commanders who start coming to that solution. It's not imposed from above. They come onto that uh, solution themselves. They restructure their armour and infantry uh, brigades, for example, to work collectively together on the battlefield as opposed to fighting separately. That worked okay in North Africa. It was functional. It wasn't ideal, but they hadn't had enough to, to reject that. That was the first thing, actually getting the infantry on the tanks and moving them with them, which meant that when you hit a problem, infantry bail out, you've got infantry immediately available to help identify and deal with the problem and come to solutions. The other is, of course, the, the introduction of, I suppose, crude armoured personnel carriers to get the infantry moving with the armour. And they're doing this by totalizing. It's often cited this is a Canadian innovation, which it was in, in, to a degree in practice, but uh, the British had been... Uh, O'Connor had been asking for this some time before, and his Dempsey blocked it prior to Goodwood, said that we haven't got time, he wasn't sure whether it's such a good idea. And by putting infantry in armoured vehicles, fully tracked armoured vehicles, and moving with the tanks, suddenly you had a kind of a mixed formation that could adapt quickly and that was the, the biggest innovation. They still have problems afterwards, but that's really the way in which they needed to go, I think. Question four. Was there any appreciation that the Germans might operate in a similar manner to the way they did on the Eastern Front? And were there any efforts to communicate the lessons learnt from that? They didn't have much in the way of conversation with the Red Army. The only times I've seen it in terms of cooperation, as learning something that the Russians are telling them, uh, occasionally related to a, a comment about kit that the German were using in MI-10 reports where they've gathered information from the Soviets whether the Soviets knew about this or not is another matter, in some cases they didn't about what equipment the Germans were using because of course in a lot of cases the Allies don't really encounter it a great deal until Italy, by which time it's too late to influence what they're doing it's one of the big critics about why British tanks are undergunned and so on, it's too late by the time it comes to that, but one factor in terms of doctrine, not a great deal, no there are a few passing comments in some of the, the overlord planning about what the Germans might do, but their perception is that because of the circumstances in Northwest Europe, they won't employ dig-in tactics because it, it didn't make any sense to them. So when the Germans do do it, in a way, I, you could sort of imagine uh, if they sat back and thought about it, 21st Army Group starts saying, this is a result, you know, they're playing into our hands, but now we've got to seize the opportunity of, of what they're doing. But in terms of actual battle doctrines, no. Although th 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 they did talk about the way in which the Soviets had used tank riders, and it was the, the Royal Armoured Corps report, if I recall, which states that this is a really bad idea, and so we shouldn't do it. But in the circumstances, nor do they have to, and it works to a degree. Question 5. With reference to Goodwood, large numbers of tanks were obliterated by the Germans. Was that because the tanks used were substandard armour, or was it because there wasn't infantry in close support to suppress enemy fire? Both points come into play. Good was an intre is, is the interesting example because it's the one that's most usually rolled out, an example of what the British do badly, and it is a bad operation. Dempsey said after the war, strategically it was the right thing to do, but tactically it was a mess, and he's quite right. Principally, Goodwood does not conform to the operational technique that has been set down and the, the accepted way of doing things, which is that you advance so far under the cover of your artillery, get the enemy to attack you, and then you hit them. Goodwood goes beyond that, and the operational research unit, Tony Sargent, I think it was, who was uh, the armour expert, looked at the Goodwood plan beforehand 
and argued against it, it isn't conforming to what we're supposed to do. It's going to overstep the mark, we're going to outpace our artillery support, and when the counterattack comes, we will struggle to defeat it. So that's one particular view, that they don't have the firepower support to defeat any localised counterattacks properly, although they do, in a way. The other point about the infantry and um, armour cooperating on the battlefield, the uh, 11th Armoured Division Commander Roberts had argued that he wanted his infantry brigade to work with, more closely with the armoured brigade when they went forward. But they weren't. They were kept back in order to secure the position of a couple of the villages in the early stages of the campaign. So the armoured brigade was herring off on its own, and it's largely armour with one infantry uh, battalion working with it, spread out between the three regiments uh, of armour. So there's not enough infantry support available. But they're under strict orders to bypass pockets of resistance and keep going. If the enemy's in a position to start shooting at you, then you've got problems. And there are also problems with air support and so on. Sometimes overstated, but there are problems with it. So it, it breaks all the rules that they set for themselves. Whether it's the tanks? No, I, I don't think it is. Max Hastings says that if the, uh, the, the British had... The German tanks at Goodwood, Goodwood have succeeded. It's claptrap. I'm sorry, it's, it's just not true. Half the German tanks would have broken down halfway through the operation anyway. But it's nothing to do with the, the, the kit, I don't think. It doesn't help that the Sherman tank burst into flames far too often once it was hit. Obviously, that's bad for morale. But that wasn't why they were getting knocked out. That's what happened after they'd been knocked out. And Allied gunnery would have done pretty much the same to most German armour in those circumstances. So it, it breaks the rules, it was identified beforehand. Infantry is used to secure the position rather than working with the armour for reasons which imply that Montgomery wasn't expecting a breakthrough. You know, secure the position, but let's see how far the armour goes. And that resulted in problems. Question six. Were the operational objectives communicated to lower level commanders? It's one of the usual things that's uh, wheeled out. The Germans use mission-based command and the Allies use orders-based command. Well, to a degree that's true, but not in the way that it's often portrayed. Montgomery was very keen on a clear battle plan and everybody knowing what they were going to do. So your objective is to get there and do that and stick to that plan, don't deviate. What he didn't want, he also... I mean, it, it tells us a good deal about Montgomery, I suppose. He wanted a tidy battlefield. This kind of brings out kind of the alien retentiveness approach or, or characteristic. It's all got to be clear. Everybody could know what they're doing and stick to the plan. So they have a clear idea of what they're doing, and most junior officers, middle-ranking to junior officers, are quite happy about that. The one thing he, Montgomery does do is keep things simple. And that has particular benefits. They have a clear idea. This is what you're doing. This is where you get to. You'll have this support. Go down there. The problem with that, of course, is that if going down there actually presents difficulties, it's not so easy then to deviate from the plan. And Montgomery was hard on officers who did so, even if sometimes it was the right thing to do in that particular circumstance. So you wanted a tight control so that the whole thing, the whole package worked. But it was cl clearly communicated, and better, I mean, you know more about this than me, that um, in North Africa, prior to Montgomery's arrival, so Montgomery claimed, so maybe something in like that, there was too much confusion about options and he wanted to keep things simple so that everything was tightly organised on the battlefield. It's a price to pay for that, but in the circumstances it worked. <laughs> Professor Buckley can be contacted by email at j.buckley, spelt Bravo Uniform Charlie Kilo Lima Echo Yankee, at wlv.ac.uk. Thank you.